This is episode 130 of the XY podcast with Lee Shadell. We are so excited to have Lee on the podcast. Her approach to giving advice and financial coaching is incredibly unique, and it's been so awesome to watch her journey over the last few years. Lee made the full transition from financial advisor to certified money coach in June 2018 when she hung up her advice hat for the last time and gave up her license. She's the yoga teacher, wellness coach, and creative entrepreneur blending health and financial well-being to help her clients take ownership of their financial decisions. In this chat with Adrian from XY, Lee shares her fascination with behavioral psychology and how this has shaped her journey to becoming one of the few certified money coaches in Australia. She explains how she is blending yoga and financial coaching, what her money coaching process with clients actually looks like, and shares a few ideas on how advisors can add money coaching to their own value prop in a seemingly overcompliant industry. Lee is also putting together a course for the XY training platform, which we know will be well received as this is such a huge topic of discussion within the XY Facebook group. We really hope you enjoy this episode. And if you would like to be notified as soon as Lee's course hits the XY platform, reach out at xyadvisor.com. This podcast is brought to you by Salesforce, blazed new trails to richer client relationships with the world's number one CRM. Salesforce has designed the Financial Services Cloud to help you make every interaction personalized through rich client profiles centered on personal goals and pivotal life events. You can nurture deeper relationships with proactive tracking and event alerts that remind you to reach out when clients need you the most. Supercharge your productivity by managing client engagements, household relationships, and financial life goals all from the one connected platform. It's the world's number one CRM imagined just for wealth management. Salesforce is excited to partner with XY Advisor to discuss how you can build richer client relationships and unlock loyalty. Lovely to have you on. It's been a while. It has. I think last time we were chatting, you're in, in an airport. That was our earlier <laughs> podcast where we were, um, there was a uh, calls of uh, your Adelaide flight 202 is coming in in between all these brilliant um, brilliant pieces of information about how you're doing advice at the time <laughs> nothing much has changed I think there's been many more airports since more then. airports <laughs> yeah you have been doing a bit of travel haven't you yeah yeah I have but more internationally now so mm. Mm. what's uh, what are some of the cooler places you've been uh, in the last six months, mostly the US, although Canada as well, but yeah, the west coast of the US. Any skiing or anything while you've been over there? Uh, I was there for winter, but no, I'm not very much of a skier. I'm okay. a water skier, not a snow skier. I'm oh, nice. Mm. Well, the, when you're up on the coast, was that Oregon as well? Yeah, there? in Oregon. Yeah, Portland. Beautiful. Such yeah. a cool place. I haven't been there, but I've heard really good things. Great surf, apparently. Yeah, the coast, Oregon coast is great surf. And a lot of um, Californians are moving up to Portland to live because it's cheaper prices and it's just a really funky place. So, yeah, is that, yeah, is that where, I don't know, was it Uber or Lyft started there or something? Um, it's the head of Nike. So head I'm not of Nike, sure. okay. I think Uber... I thought one of those, um, or maybe they put up one of the biggest spots in the US or something, and that's maybe. why it's... So. Yeah, maybe. I mean, Lyft is prolific over there. Is so, it? Yeah, it's huge. And, and Uber, but there's a What's lot of... What's the... Is there any difference? Because we don't have Lyft, obviously, over here. Is there any difference? Not really. It's just a little bit cheaper, I guess. Okay. Um, and I think there was another... I was talking to a Lyft driver once, and he was saying that they have to go through more checks, like security checks, to be a Lyft driver than they do oh, So Uber's driver. a bit looser. Yeah. Which is surprising. Uh, oh, I wasn't. Yeah, no, it makes a lot more sense with the Uber drives I've had more recently. That <laughs> yeah. seems like the uh, requirements are dropping. Yeah, they do. I feel like they? I'm hopping in taxis again. It's, yeah, I know. So, and they've got the GPS there, so I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Must be easier up on the Gold Coast by these days. Uh, the, yeah. the roads don't get as complicated up here. No, so. they don't. It's pretty chilled out here. Yeah, and you have you been here for a bit, or you sort of gonna? I got back from the US almost two months ago now, so yeah, back here for a bit. Um, mm. It'll be my base, but I am doing a lot of travel, and we'll be doing more workshops in Bali, and going back to the US in June just yeah, for a cool. few weeks, and going. Well, I guess for... a few people are probably listening, going, "How are you running a financial advice business like that?" So maybe it's maybe we need to sort of explain back, yeah. yeah what how have we got into yeah. i guess what now is like a it's an online business and mm-hmm. yeah what, what was the transition like and what where did you where did i start yeah, yeah. <laughs> um so full transition was around about june last year so it's coming up a year um from 
basically handing back my license um, as a full financial advisor and focusing purely on money coaching. So I made a decision to make my business 100% location independent so that I can travel wherever in the world and that I can also work with clients everywhere in the world. And that's been really exciting because I've got clients um, in Ireland, Sweden, Venezuela, Colombia, US, Canada, Australia, awesome. Bali, India. <laughs> and they're obviously good reasons to go to those countries to correct. visit the clients. So. Yeah, correct. Tax deductible, of course. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> There's method in my madness, right? <laughs> um, but I wanted to do that from a lifestyle point of view. I love traveling. Um, I wanted to not have to be tied down to see clients face-to-face. I still will if I'm in the area and I can. I will see them face-to-face, but everything's done on Zoom. Um, mm-hmm. And it's all just pure money coaching. So behavioral psychology of money, not looking at any other aspect outside of that except for cash flow planning. I do that as well. Yeah. I. This is... We could go quite deep here because a lot of people think cash flow and they think like maybe a buckets approach is sort of organizing the money a bit, but like the depth, this whole behavioral finance side of things or how do you relate to money? Like, yeah, it's so intriguing. Like it's, yeah. but I've never gone past the intriguing state to yeah. go, oh, how do we actually do something with this? this sort of um, state of affairs. Like it's It's fascinating. It's actually when you get to the real reason behind the purpose of money in someone's life, like the triggers for them, what fears they have around it, what their aspirations are, what their beliefs are and their habits, you can go really deep with your clients and it's just really exciting conversations. Mm -hmm. You're having conversations around, it's more like a psychology kind of conversation because you're talking about, you know, what does money mean to you and, and what were the messages that you heard growing up and then got instilled into you and, and why do you keep doing the stuff that you keep trying not to do? Like it's like self sabotage. So we're looking into a lot of that. Um, it's fascinating. So it works really well with cash flow planning and spending coaching because you're looking at habits and behaviours and then you're looking at what the triggers and the emotions are that are driving those behaviours as well. Yeah, because it's easy enough to go, okay, well, this is what's coming in, this is what going out like if we do this this and that then it's going to look a lot better but like the practicality of the change that needs to occur to yeah to make that happen like we can't look at money just from a pure numbers or logical point of view because it's an emotional topic and it's a core survival topic as well so it it brings out fears from clients and talking like maslow's hierarchy of needs that sort of thing yeah for sure so how do you a take a left brain approach to something that's actually more about life like it's a tool that we use in our life to bring the things that we want into our lives so if we just take a pure left brain approach we're completely discounting all the emotions and the habits and the feelings that are going on behind it and clients know that they should be spending less than they're earning they know that but they can't control their behaviors um, most of the time or they know that they should be putting more money away into super or put more money into it investing or paying off debt yet they just can't help themselves so my role is to get to the point of what's what's causing that what's that reason if we can find that reason then then we can help you move forward so mm. it's um a bit of strategy a bit of planning it's like when, is it like when a masseuse is on your back sort of yeah. going around There's and spot. they find that spot yeah. and they just get in there and you're like oh lee i don't want to talk about it anymore tears there's always tears <laughs> trust me it's so different like it's so unusual to be with clients all the time and they're crying and i'm mm. just um like what sort of proportion of meetings are we talking like oh i'd say initially because it's a step-by-step process yeah probably that, that first taken. crack the nut sort of meeting yeah. is um most of my clients like 90 wow. percent of clients i'd say wow tears yeah that's yeah. um that's breakthroughs for a lot of people i guess that's it's because we hold so much emotion around money. Like mm. we make money in charge of our measure of success and our self-worth and our happiness and we define ourselves as good and bad people by the amount of money we have and what we've done with money. So it holds a lot of fear and regret and jealousy and remorse and mm. grief and judgment. And So once you start talking about some of that stuff and you give people a place to explore it, then there's always tears. But that's also like, wow, release of... Yeah, Thank yeah. God I've been able to talk to someone about this and normalize it because we don't talk about it. So mm. it just becomes this thing where we're like, oh, well, everything's fine, but underneath the surface it's not. So It's a bit like if you've got, like, you don't use your body as much and the certain muscles that maybe don't get activated, you're sitting mm. down all day, mm. all of a sudden you start doing that. It's quite an impact to the body. You're feeling it. Yeah. 
Yeah, you But are. it's also a release at the same time. Yeah, it is for sure. It's really mm. interesting. Yeah. So like you, like we talked about the journey you went on in terms of more sort of, uh, I guess it was the Lee just wants to travel the world sort of thing. And, <laughs> um, that was the intent there. But I guess Mindful World started a lot earlier. So that's yeah. been going for how many years now? Since 2014. Yeah. So, yeah. Coming up five years. And what, what was the, what kicked that off? What was... That was the yoga journey that I was on. So I was full-time financial planning and I was kind of feeling pretty empty, like feeling like my business is doing really well and I'm helping lots of clients, but I still felt like there was something missing. And I was contemplating maybe I do a career change, maybe I leave the industry and do something else. I didn't know what that was, but um, started studying yoga and then got into the whole psychology and philosophy of yoga fascinated by that so did a year program and then that kind of but kicked started my interest in behavioral psychology Mm -hmm. so then I started studying mindfulness and um, positive psychology and became a wellness coach and then a behavioral money coach as well so I'm just fascinated I'm always reading books on habits and beliefs and how the body and the mind and the emotions can play out and you know we can harbor a lot of stuff in our bodies and started to see a lot of it's kind of ironic I'm helping people manage their money on one hand and then I was trying to help them relieve the stress caused by money through the yoga studio mm. so it was kind of starting to see you had a good toolkit there yeah, yeah so. come see me here and then I yeah. <laughs> upsell yeah do you like fries with that in yeah. yoga session more holistic more yeah. holistic <laughs> I think I just decided that I didn't want to be financial advisor and yoga teacher. I wanted just to be me. So mm. for me to be truly authentic in my client relationships, I wanted to bring all of me to that. And I didn't want to be like decompartmentalize my life mm. into, well, here I play this role and here I'm this person. I was just like, no, this is me. I am a yoga teacher and I'm about money and I can do both. Why do they have to be separate? Are we talking like almost like staying as an advisor was, and what you were doing around that was almost putting a Band-Aid on mm-hmm. how you really felt about what was valuable and what you wanted to do? Yeah. Yeah. I was just doing, I was just going through the motions and I liked it, but I wasn't, I wasn't passionate about it. Mm. And I think something was missing and I wasn't sure what that was, but I knew that education was a really important part for me. I was really, I've always loved to write content and do the whole education program with my clients to make sure that they could make their own decisions, not just follow my advice. And I think deciding from there, hang on, maybe I can coach them instead of tell them what to do with their money. Mm. So I've, I'm a big believer that all the information we need is out there in the world. We just need to support people to help them understand how to make better decisions mm. and doing that in a way that, yes, it's logical, but it's also aligned to your true vision and values and then also your instinct. So teaching people a framework so that they are empowered and educated enough to to do it themselves. Mm. That's kind of my role rather than sitting there going, you need to do this with your life because they're the expert in their lives. I'm not. I'm mm. an outsider saying, this is what I think you should do. But I, I, I didn't, I never felt quite comfortable telling people what to do with their, with their money. Cause they're the expert. Yeah. 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 I like my, my style of advice was always more just like, I was like, so what do you, this is what can be done. What do you want to do? Like, yeah. let's sort of yeah. getting them to opt in. Cause yeah. like, I don't know, when you don't take ownership of decisions, then you're not really on board. Correct. Right? You're not vested in it, right? Mm. And you also, I feel that the role that advisors play is more like choice architecture. Like, here's all mm. the choices. Here's how you weed out the ones that aren't appropriate for mm. you. And then what have we got left? What's going to work for you in your situation? And I always sort of thought of it that way more. And I liked the the problem-solving aspect of being an advisor that always really interested me. Yeah, totally. Um, well, you, you had a bit of a power planning background even before? I did. Like I ran an outsourced power planning company in 2011 for two years before I sold that. Yeah. Yeah, so I've always enjoyed that aspect of it. Yeah, the strategy side of things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's interesting when you talk about, like, the telling and the asking and the... Yeah. Do you think there is a place for the telling or do you think... It. Everyone needs to go through a, that decision process. There's always going to be a need for advice and need for the telling aspect. But mm. uh, the, the segment of clients that I'm working with, they don't need to be told. They just need to be shown how to, how to make decisions and how to take responsibility for their own life. Mm. So I talk to them about your financial health is just like you would manage your 
physical health or your mental health you take responsibility for it you work out what what needs to be done which areas need Mm. to have focus and attention and then you prioritize that and you go okay well if i want to get fit then i'm going to have to you know actually go to the gym and i might have to change my diet and i might have to learn about what good food i put in my body and what i don't same with money it's just a skill that you can learn the Mm. same approach just think about it as you would any other area of your well-being do you do you draw the line? Where do you where do you draw the line between the money coaching and like those other examples you're just talking about, like health and wellness and yeah. fitness? Because obviously, very passionate about that space. And yeah, yeah, I take a more holistic approach to talking to my clients about well being, and I talk about well, how do we use this resource? We've got a few resources in our life, you know, time, energy, money. How do we use our resources to bring us more of what we want in life? So it is a little bit more holistic. There is a little bit of an element of life coaching, for want of a better word. Mm-hmm. Um, and we will talk about, okay, what, what things do you need to improve in your life? And if you've got all the money but you're not bringing you know, well-being in other areas, then what's the point? So we do have those conversations around what else can you be doing in different areas of your well-being, for sure. Yeah, I've always been like drawn to – because you're sitting there and you get like an advice conversation – is goes you, you understand a lot about people yeah. and like it's so i used to find it so hard when you're sitting there and you're understanding oh there's things that they could probably do there and there and there and it was really outside the structure that i understood to be mm. for advice like mm. like from the financial standpoint and yeah. And you're like, oh, this stuff doesn't really matter unless that, like, unless you sort of shit out over there. Like, yeah, it's and so it's true, that sort right? of, yeah. yeah, it's frustrating. So I really, I really get it. I've, I've always been really, impre- I've, I always struggled to, how do you draw the line? Where do you draw the line? I always, went, well, I've got, I think I know what the problem is. I want to, I want to be able to tell you and help you. Yeah. Well, that's, um, I mean, that's the beauty of being a money coach is that you can have those conversations. It's, it's, it is in the scope. The scope is whatever you want it to be. So as long as you're not talking product, you can mm. scope out that, but everything else is on the table because you're coaching them and I'm talk about, there's no such thing as money decisions, they're life decisions. So we have really strong conversations around what are your values? What kind of life do you want to live? How do you define wealth and what makes you feel wealthy? Even asking clients about what makes you feel wealthy, a lot of them can't actually articulate that. I'm like, well, how can we ever have it if we can't articulate it? So we go through the exercise, okay, well, it may be things like, I need to live near the beach and I really want to be around my family and my health makes me feel really wealthy and sunshine and you know money. Yes, of course, but there's other elements. And mm. then we start getting a plan around, okay, this is what you need in your life. So now we look at our resources and say, well, how are we going to allocate those resources? Mm. We have time, energy, money to bring this into our life. Mm-hmm. That's essentially what coaching is all about. Mm. So you, you've gone deep into this space. Yeah. But my understanding is that you see it as something that is very relevant to be added to an advisor kit yeah. in terms of existing advisors, experts in the financial space, really mm-hmm. like a lot, of, a lot of them are having discussions around this mm-hmm. space mm-hmm. and they're probably skirting around all of the stuff that you're talking about. But mm-hmm. in generally, maybe a, a lot, generally a lot less structured yeah, and, sure. and in turn effective. Yeah. So... How much do you think this, do you think this should be mandated across the board as what advisors should be? Yeah, I do. I do. I feel like, um, you're right. I was certainly having variations of these conversations with my clients when I was an advisor, um, but not to the depth or the structure that I do now. And that's because I didn't have a framework and I Mm. didn't have a model to work with. So now that I do, um, obviously it's a much deeper process, but even incorporating some of the principles into your advice offering can only just deepen your client relationships Mm. and your connection with your client and actually understand what their drivers are and what they're actually wanting to achieve and and what is holding them back. Mm. Because if we can work out what behaviors and habits and emotions are going to crop up for them, we can create a plan that they're actually going to be able to work through it and and achieve what they say they want to achieve. Mm. If we just set a plan and then we go, good luck, we'll see you in six months, it's, it's, it's putting the onus back on them, but we're almost setting them up to fail because Mm -hmm. we're not supporting or guiding them to say well here we're going to help you through that process and if you look to the u.s and the models in the u.s a lot of advice businesses have an advisor and a coach so you go and see your 
your okay. advisor and the advisor sets the long-term strategy. They're the strategic thinker and they're going to implement all the solutions, but the coach is the one who's going to hold their hand and see them regularly and mm. make sure that they're staying on track to that destination. So is the coach out of the licensed regime then? Is that... Yeah. That's how yeah. They... So they do it together and then mm. some... I mean, I think you could be a coach and an advisor, but an advisor is already such a full-time job. It's mm. like a couple of jobs in one. So yeah. adding another aspect to that would be good from an understanding point of view to talk mm. to your clients, but to take on the role of coach and advisor is huge. Mm. Doable, but mm. it's just a lot to... To do, and that's probably why I stepped out of advice. I had mm. to, you know, I'm a if I'm going to do something, I want to do 100%, and mm. was, I can't do both. So, which one brings me more satisfaction in the coaching role? Yeah, totally. Mm. It's a, I, I guess as you're talking, I'm thinking there's almost like I think the role of the advisor is big, like it's yeah. it's it's such a broad role, mm-hmm. and like not just when you look at best interest duty, it's mm-hmm. just. The different facets of activity, even if you took out all the regulation that that sort of applied and makes it very difficult for advisors to get through what they need to get through, they're on the front end, they're talking, they've got the people skills, they're relating to people, they're um, they're doing sales, customer service, Mm -hmm. they're then talking, um, a lot of them are doing the strategy and the the research and the administration and all across, and there's a whole lot of different skill sets that go on there. There are. And like and that's just the baseline. And, and then that's you... for ones who aren't even running their own business as well. So you mm. add in this if you're running your own business. Yeah, there's the business that. management and <laughs> it's huge. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I guess where I'm thinking is sort of like I've started to see it as you almost some of that a lot a lot of the strategy stuff needs to get let go, I think. Mm. That's where um, I see the ability to do both. I think if you really just hold on to that front end interface of the conversations with the client yeah. and shaping up and be the educator and you you might translate the strategy stuff mm-hmm. or prepare a client in terms of and canvas the major expectations of what's going to go on there. Yeah. But uh, there's great power planners that can take care of that. There are heaps of great power planners, yeah. And, and that's like, what they love. You know, mm. That's where you work out what, what are you good at and what do you love and then start to do more of those aspects and try and outsource the rest of it. Because I think you're right. I think where the focus needs to be is 100% client relationships and trying to get the best outcomes for your clients. But all the other stuff that's going on behind, it just bogs you down. It just makes – it's like wading through mud trying to get – you know, get make a profitable business. It's mm. difficult. All the, all the stuff you need to be across. Like it's yeah. just – I know. It's huge. Yeah. Yeah, it's huge. And I, I look back now and think, wow, I, yeah, I've got almost mm, – I hate to say it, 20 years experience in the industry. Um, and I'm probably the happiest I have been in this career choice. But I wish I'd known about it a lot mm. earlier. But I guess it wasn't around. It's been around in the US for 20 plus years, but yeah. it's new here. I think I think one of the challenges with advisors is that coming into the role, you, you, you're visualizing the role as this very fixed structure. Mm. And and it's not helped by the, all the infra- the structure around it with the licensee regime mm-hmm. and the rules and regulations. Mm-hmm. It almost um, because it because that I guess diminishes the latitude that you have to be creative and mm-hmm. to adjust how things are done. Like a lot of people don't feel like they they can really move out of that space, especially now, and it's just getting yeah. worse and worse for a number of licensees. Yeah. So, but. Have you seen advisors, and this one of the one of the key areas is around splitting up the the charging mm-hmm. for stuff, mm-hmm. and I think this is a really key area, mm-hmm. one that licensees are sort of they've not been very good at because mm-hmm. especially the aligned ones, mm-hmm. um, and they've almost put up roadblocks for advisors to do this, and mm-hmm. and it's been an impediment to actually really chase that product market fit with the client, so to speak, in terms of yeah. they're sitting there, their clients want. You can see the needs are there. Their clients are sort of uh, communicating and it's obvious that this stuff is valuable. Mm -hmm. And you're within this sort of cocoon sort of environment where you're like, oh, can I do that? Like, am I going to get in trouble? Mm -hmm. How do I have that conversation? There's no resources have been put into making it so I can can have that conversation because all I see is what I do, my next step goes to a research and a, a power planning team. And all they know is like, 
products and stuff. Yep. So like, even if I have this conversation and I serve up this to the next step, there's no one there to really take it off me. Yeah. And then it forces it back on the advisor to try and work out the process. But they've got so much other shit going on. So they kind of... So, yeah, I think that's the issue. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree. <laughs> um, I, I do. I feel like there's not a lot of scope for innovation in the industry uh, because of the pressures of compliance and the pressures of running a profitable business and the, just the, the time constraints of trying to, to think outside the square and implement something that is within the requirements and the control and the legislation. and the It's difficult, but I... I guess that's probably why I always had a problem with it because I was, I was thinking this is not working and we're just we're all doing the same process in the same way and I had an issue with that and I've never liked to do things the same way as everyone else you know if I've got a better way of doing it for me I'm going to do it that way but it's having the guts to try and challenge that and try and do it too which can be can be difficult I had a really supportive dealer group so it was it was mm. great but um yeah, I just always thought, well, there's something wrong here. I mean, why are we all, all of us, doing the same process? It doesn't. No, no other industry does things the same way mm. as we do. Mm. Like, there's innovation in every other in- industry. Yeah. Yet in ours, it's like, no, this is the cookie cutter approach. There's the steps to financial planning. It's quite the, the, the irony, isn't it? That ASIC's so concerned about cookie cutter advice, but yeah. the <laughs> the force of structure. Oh what they forced on the industry almost channels some of that yeah. um, and the structure of the industry. Yeah, and exactly. I did a presentation yesterday um, to a corporate health and wellbeing day on financial wellbeing. There are 150 federal government employees there. I'm talking about financial wellbeing and the importance of getting advice and making a plan and, and seeing an advisor. And the questions were that came up, how do I find a good advisor? That's coming out from the... And I said, there's so many good advisors out there. You just need to make sure that you do your research and you find someone who knows what you're talking about and what you want to achieve and that you connect with. And But it was fascinating to see that that was one of the most asked questions. How mm. do I find a good advisor? And I'm, mm. I'm thinking, what a shame that that's the conversation that's being had at the moment. And that's purely because of what's happened in the industry lately. Mm. I, well, uh, I guess if you look at the guidance that's put out there, it's very... It's very, it's all about sort of looking out for risks. Yeah. As opposed to actually connecting with people. Yeah. Like the rhetoric and the, <laughs> the wording yeah. is, is not helping the situation. Yeah. Um, when like, if you, when you talk about advisors and where they, when they love their job, it's when they're working with people where they really connect and where people love advisors, it's, mm. there's that relatability and it's all about that. Yeah. Like half the people that have an amazing, well, probably more than half, they don't even care what the advice is. No, because it's about the relationship and there's trust and good communication and there's a connection. Mm. That's what's really important. It's just a shame that we're not advertising that more, mm. the power of that in in the good stories. Like there's so much bad news and bad press and there's a huge market of disengaged consumers out there who need support and advice and they, they need to have it maybe accessible in different ways from a funding point of view, mm. the cost point of view, but also just how do I a- approach someone I don't think just going to see a traditional advisor appeals to the majority of the population. It mm. does to some, but there's even research says like 48% of women are not comfortable going to see a financial advisor mm. in the traditional form. Yeah, that so, more formal approach. With, yeah. Yeah, and the structured, you know, you pay a large upfront fee to go and get everything changed all at once. Mm. And, you know, we get this big SOA and we just change everything we've ever done with money because it's all wrong. I, I have talk like that. That's what that. we have to do. That's the structure. I know it is, and that I've I always had an issue with that because I used to think, am I the type of person who wants to go in and see an advisor who then tells me that everything that I've done with my money has been okay, but we're going to change it all? So I always thought well, I wouldn't want to hear that. I would be overwhelmed walking out, going, "We're going to change my insurance, my super, my investments. My, we're going to change it all right now with this great plan." Lee, you make it sound so silly. <laughs> yeah, who would have thought? <laughs> we, I, I think we've really gone into the issue, haven't we? Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking you've got a you got a whole toolkit about like unless I'm not just talking about what you're doing now, but I guess mm-hmm. what you were doing before as well, because I think 
there's a few different ways that advisors can start to mm -hmm. um, one one thing you're talking about is the touch points around how do you first engage with people as mm. they warm up to advice mm. so I think that's a big area but it's also also I think also um, that can be quite simplistic because you can look at it from the traditional sense and just but also how a framework around how an advisor can run even that because what kills a lot of that stuff is compliance. Yeah. Because it is a really intuitive sort of flow with clients when you're doing that stuff mm -hmm. and having those conversations. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to know your suggestions around that sort of the warming up of the, the client into the, the process, but also how advisors that even if they're in the most um, com strongest compliance regime, very institutional licensee, mm -hmm. um, what can they do to expand that scope a little bit yeah. but still not have to rock the boat of their existing structure too much? Yeah, good question. <laughs> Questions. Big one. Um, I'll big just one. sit back for a little bit. <laughs> yeah. uh. um, all right, so let's have a think about the second part of the question around how can they bring in more elements to their offering. I think, yes, there's compliance everywhere. Yes, there's structure and, and, and regimen around control around what you can and can't do. But that's only if you're talking about product. So you remove that from the conversation, particularly initially to connect with your clients. And you'll, if you have a toolkit of five really deep questions and you can really drill down really deep into that, what drives your clients or what lights them up and what's the most important values to them and what they're aspiring to create and achieve in their life. If you can get right down to that, I think that's going to really enhance the conversation, but also the quality of the, of the advice you're giving mm. because you're actually tapping into what's the reason for you being here? Mm. Like it's, it's, I know you're probably being here because it's something you think you should be doing, but there's a core driver here too. And, and if you can find out what that is for your clients, then you can build a plan that, that they'll be the best clients you've ever had because they'll be so grateful that you can help them achieve what really drives them and what they're really passionate about. So you're talking about really just um, maybe ex oh, iterating the conversation you have on yeah. the front end yeah. to just... And that plays into the existing structure. Yeah, definitely. Just mm. deeper conversations. Cause... How do you, I guess, writing notes around that and that whole mm -hmm. file note space is so hectic now. What what sort of, is there any tips around that and how to articulate these sort of things? Because I think. Record, record your clients. Just record it? Ask them, is it okay if I record this? Yeah. I record, my work is all on Zoom and I record all of my meetings. Um, one, to protect myself, <laughs> um, just from a compliance point of view. Um, but also because you can't you can't actually remember a lot of the stuff when you're going into deeper conversations. You want to actually be able to put it back to them in their own words, in their, their own language, and say, this is what, you, what you've said. Mm. And you can reflect that back to your clients in their own language, then they can it resonates better. Again, you're creating a better connection and you're really saying reflective listening, okay, I'm listening to what you're saying and I'm getting it. Um, so recording is a great way, saves a lot of time and then you can get it transcribed or I use Google Voice or voice to text a lot. Yep. So I'm, I hate typing up. Just those, for everyone so. out there, that's, that's actually, if you've got an Android, it's actually on your phone. Okay. Like it's available. It's a free app. If you use Google Docs, it's in there too, yep. which is great. Yeah. It's very accurate too. Yeah, it is. It's actually really good. No. Yeah. How good? Um, my favorite thing now is like Google writes my email. That's uh. What's that? Tell me about that. Well, it's just the auto text. Like you start. Oh, I know, and it like finishes your sentences. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's that's, I wasn't accurate. thinking that, but that's probably better. Let's go with that. <laughs> <laughs> that's me too. I'm like, oh, that sounds better than what I was going to write. <laughs> Done. It's phenomenal. It really gives a bit of an insight into the, the future direction. The AI of everything. Yeah, mm. it's going to be interesting. But little things like, yeah, recording to make things easier. Um, less words, more pictures. But more what about... I, I think that my mind goes through is like you capture all that data, all that... Mm. Like I was always worried, like, shit, you have this whole broad conversation what's what's in what's out what's what needs to go into like a document and mm -hmm. yeah how do you do that what do you yeah that's a good question so what when i'm doing my work from a coaching point of view and mm. i'm collecting all of this information um they do homework so they write stuff for me and then i'll we'll talk and i'll make notes and I'm collating and looking for things. Does that start to go into a structure as you're doing that process? Yeah. So I create what's called a blueprint for my clients so yeah. that they can see all of their patterning and beliefs and habits with money and then 
what I, well, the reason we do that is to create the awareness because we cannot shift or change what we're not aware of. And mm. a lot of what we do with money, 95% of it is subconscious or unconscious behaviors and habits and thoughts. So bringing it up to the surface, shining a light on it, looking at it one thing to go, wow, that's actually what, what I do and what I think and how I feel. And then that's where we create a plan to move forward from. But grabbing bits of information, looking for patterns, looking for themes, um, it's, yeah, it's probably information overload, but it's almost like putting together pieces of the jigsaw. So mm. it's good. It's fascinating. And and are you saying that you don't always use all that information right then? Correct. Yeah. It may play into things. To later on, yeah. 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 Because I'm not doing it's a It's a journey, right? I'm mm. not in a hurry to get to the destination and neither are my clients. So it's all about how do we start step by step working with this stuff. It's I'm not in a hurry to deliver them all my value and then go, okay, see you later. I'll see you in six months' time. It's a partnership and we work together regularly over a longer period of time. So yeah. it's like, okay, let's just collect information as we go and then that might come in useful later when we're doing something else. So, okay. So you're collecting um, a broad range of information that go into a, a framework. Mm. So you've got it organized to an extent from your standpoint. Yep. And from a process standpoint, are there stages that you're going through as well? Is that sort of, is it that structured? Yeah. 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 So we've got what I got, what's called the core process that I was trained in, which is all the awareness piece. This is to look back at a client's situation to, in order to see how they got to where they are today. So we need to go backwards and start from the beginning and say, okay, let's go through your whole history with money and see what's happened and why. And then from there, that gives us a really great awareness around why, you, why you're standing here right now with the situation that you're in. And then we go forward and say, okay, well, now that we've got that information and we know where you are, we need to look forward and say, what do you want to achieve? Mm -hmm. So we've got the awareness of what is likely to be the roadblocks or the things that might stop them from achieving that. And that's where I'm like, okay, now we've got the plan for the future. I know what could potentially go wrong. We're going to make a plan to make sure that doesn't happen. Okay. So, yeah. It's deep. It is deep. <laughs> it's awesome though. It's, it's, yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. It's kind of, um, it's exciting and it's cool because you're actually helping clients achieve whatever is most meaningful to them. So it's about, I talk, we go back to that Maslow's hierarchy of needs, what mm. you were talking about before. If we're looking at the concept of that and we're trying to achieve self-actualization ultimately mm. as a human species, um, if we do not have the financial part, the very base level, the foundation sorted, it's like snakes and ladders. My clients go up and then they like go down a couple mm. of rungs and then up and then down. It's like yeah. a shaky. So we talk about the fact that they need to really get that part sorted first and then we can move up towards self-actualization. Do you find do you find that you have to bring in um, specialist resources depending on which way the conversation goes? Yeah. So a lot of my clients have an advisor. I'm just the person that keeps them uh, basically on track. Okay. So. 80% of my clients have an advisor. And if they don't, during our relationship, I'm encouraging them to go and see an advisor. Okay. Because it's almost like that toolkit that we're talking about. We need... Yeah. I'm just one little solution in in their whole <laughs> needs, you know. And yep. I think I can then partner with their other professionals to make sure that I'm supporting them. So they might have a therapist or a psychologist. They might have... You know, they've got their doctor, they've got their accountant, their financial advisor, their solicitor. Like they have all of these professionals around. Money coaches are just one of those people. So they have their business coaches and life coaches. And yeah, it's an interesting kind of way of looking at you it. Get the, you get the fun spot where there's no regulation. Oh, not yet. I'm assuming there will be. I'm assuming there will be some regulation. As any... I think any profession needs regulation. It does because you get okay. cowboys in there and you're, you know. <laughs> well, what sort of, like, because a lot of people go, like, it's a very intangible um, space for a lot of people in terms of going, what, there's a group of you? Like, is this a thing? Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what structure is there around this yeah. space? Maybe, maybe it's more advanced in the US than it is here, I guess. It's more advanced in the US for sure. Yeah. Um, what the problem, what the issue is, is that anyone can call themselves a money coach, mm. right? So there are life coaches out there who are calling themselves money coaches who haven't done any, don't have any background. In Does a life coach have a, any regulations or requirements? Yeah, there's um, less regulation. There's more suggested sort of frameworks yeah. and there are minimum levels of certification. Oh, well, they do have? Yeah. Okay. So money coaching doesn't. 
Okay. And that's what I think is I, – that's where I see a benefit of creating some kind of minimum standard of ed- education. Association of money coaches. Is yeah. that what I'm hearing? Is that... well, maybe. Don't at least look starting at a new association, everyone. Um, <laughs> just reach out to them. I am not doing that. <laughs> I do not have capacity or the intention or desire at all. <laughs> um, okay. A couple but, of years. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Watch never say never. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the US, there are a lot – there's a lot of groups and associations that support – coaching and as a space um does the government reach into that space but or no okay so it's largely unregulated okay um but in saying that money coaches are not giving any product advice so Mm. there shouldn't be an issue with it there's no it's not like we're putting clients in something that they could lose money from Mm. they can't we're teaching them we're educating them and we're teaching them how to make decisions but we're not actually giving them any advice to do anything Mm. so it's a different different way of looking at it i think it's because it's such a new space it's going to be very interesting to see well how it evolves here in australia so there are a number of coaches coming up who are starting to you know do training in the us or in the uk Mm. and starting finally to well not people of the group of taking your hot tips and gone yeah. and done a couple of courses. So yeah. it's really cool to see. It's awesome to see. I, and I want it to be a, a movement because I believe in the value of it. And I think I think there's such a huge market for here. If, if we look at – people are Googling it in the U.S., I want a money coach. You know, it's, it's a thing. Mm. <laughs> and I've always looked to the U.S. as being sort of four to five years ahead of us in this space. Mm. So I know that it's coming and it's whether we adopt it or whether we embrace it or not, mm. um, it's going to come. And well, because they, they could just do it from the U.S. Yeah, because I'm doing it from yeah, everywhere exactly. in the world. Because it's, again, it's not, it's, it helps to know the, the market that you're working in just because the language around 401ks and mm, you no know, bit of culture islands. maybe yeah but fundamentally because you're talking more around how do you relate to money what's your relationship with money and how does it you know what are your strengths and your challenges it's a it's a universal conversation so it mm. doesn't really matter where you're based so if you're we're not going to be offering it here in australia for example then coaches from around the world will be fishing in our pond yeah essentially people from online like it's got someone from south america going expert money coach yeah yeah and there are like the i'm a master certified money coach with the money coaching institute in the u.s and there are 400 coaches worldwide trained okay. so do they yeah, all run digital businesses or? a lot of them do yeah. yeah it is it's catered for a digital business space it's um you can do 60 minute conversations online you can do four to five a day from anywhere in the world it's oh, wow. an easy model I'm, I'm getting i'm seeing a bit of a solution for some people that just want to get the work out of what they're doing right now mm-hmm. um become mm-hmm. a money coach with uh with this sort of trajectory yeah so that's sort of really just going this like leads going down that path of least realization and yeah. going it's just i'm fighting i'm going against the grain mm-hmm. it's not my sort of uh, it's not making me happy doing what I'm doing mm. and it's just a constant battle so if it's feeling like that maybe it is something for people to think about it's worth considering as mm. an option um, it's going to be a very different role from being an advisor but there's enough crossover and similarities that you can bring your skill set across mm. so well, a lot of people when, when you talk about them not wanting to give up that helping people yeah. and not um, then what, what, are the, what are they trying to do that could um, give that satisfaction to them of supporting people and yeah. this is probably the closest thing that really is a channel for advisors to go into yeah i agree i think um i think it's exactly right in that sense i think it's a beautiful synergy around that it's an easy easy step aside to another career path that um has its challenges but it's you know it, it walks alongside advice very well so if you know the industry and you know your role really well then you can just slot in next mm. to that and you can work in c- conjunction with other advisors for example and say hey i can do the coaching for you um which is a great model too because i feel like there's always going to be a need and a role for advisors who love it what they do mm. and those people who we, we need you we need we need you to stay there doing what you're doing but the people who are like oh, i'm just uh, this i like helping people but this isn't really for they're me. not attached to the strategy stuff they yeah, the like they see the or, benefit of it but they're not getting kicks out of it sort of thing yeah and i'm having more and more conversations with advisors who are reaching out to me saying i'm feeling really unfulfilled i'm feeling really like 
there's got to be something else for me and I just don't know what that is and mm. Money coaching might be it, but there's lots of other things as well. So I just tell me more. Like, <laughs> what are the other options? <laughs> well, it really depends. I think if we, as like as almost like I'm coaching my clients, look at what your strengths are and look at what you're really passionate about. In oh, your we're talking like a doing. complete shift. Yeah. Yeah, like well, not even like look at your career as an advisor and what aspects of the various hats that you wear as an advisor that you love, and then consider what you're good at and what you love and what careers. You know, suit that and there are lots of other careers in the industry whether it's in funds management or education or you know there's a lot of other roles as well mm. um but also outside stepping outside the industry there's always going to be other opportunities i feel a bit torn with this conversation that um we're almost like hey um so you know how everyone sort of wants to stop doing this because it's getting a bit shit yeah. well um here's a way to leave and go do something else and and one side of me is going well shit there's not enough advisors to start with. I know. I know. And there's definitely an attrition that's going on over the next yeah. few years. Agree. Why are we making it easy for them to think through that process? Like, <laughs> I don't but know. I the other side of me goes, <laughs> who gives a shit? If people are there and they're not happy, yeah. get out. Because your clients are going to wear that Correct. one way or the other. Yeah. So. I, I agree with you. If your heart's not in it, you're doing it for the wrong reasons, I think. Because then you're not actually doing it to benefit your clients or even you're not doing something that you're passionate about. So life's too short. Do what you love and you can make a living out of about it, anything. If I can combine yoga and money, you can you can make a living out of anything. It's about having an intention and just going for it, giving it a go. What's the worst? Thing? We're talking about manifesting here. Isn't we are. <gasps> That's tonight. You and you and we got um, – because I'm just having a chat to leave before our Gold Coast event. And we've got uh, Flynn from Wealth Enhancers, and he's he's quite the manifester. I don't yeah. know if anyone saw his video on um, LinkedIn the other day. It's pretty cool. He's got a whole framework around it. And yeah. I reckon you guys can have a great chat around. Yeah, that's, that's it. cool. It's exciting. I work a lot with archetypes, and part of the key archetypes is money. Are these like money personality sort of thing? Correct. Based on Carl Jung's psychology around collective archetypes, which are our key way of attitudes and behaviors towards money. So it's not our personality as such, but it's how we show up when we've got money in our hands. And the two that we need is the warrior, which is the master of the material world, like really structured, planned, resourceful, balanced, in control, like really the logical left brain side of things. Okay. But we also need the magician, who's the manifester. So the magician is the one who holds our vision. They're like, let's go to the pokies. Yeah. Is that the magician? Well, it could be, but that's the fool. I think that's the fool. That's the fool, okay. Yeah. The fool's like, let's just have fun. <laughs> the magician's like, um, let's start a business. Is that the magician? Magician has the vision. So, yeah. yeah, let's start a business. Or this is what my values are and this is what I want to achieve in life. And I don't give a shit about anything else. This is what we're doing. And they say to the warrior, hey, Mr. Warrior, come in and let's make a plan to make this happen. It's like going to the, uh, the finance department going, can I have a bit of funding for this? Yeah, so, so. please. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. So, yeah, the warrior and the magician are what we all need. So, okay. Yeah. How many of these archetypes are there? There's eight. Okay. Yeah. Fascinating. Hmm. Take Do, a quiz. What are, the, what are the stats in terms of... Because I know with a lot of these money type things, there's, there's often um, a very... There's a centralized sort of mm-hmm. nature of like maybe two or three that dominate the so, majority of the population. Is that question. is that the same with this framework? In a way, um, for... All of my clients take the quiz before they come and see me. So I know who I'm dealing with in a sense, like what their core traits are. So the innocent archetype is very often someone who comes to me because they are lacking control. They're a little bit fearful and anxious about taking responsibility for their money and they just don't know where to start. So they're often uneducated in financial stuff. So my role is easy, help them like empower and educate them, build their confidence so that they take responsibility. So that's an easy one for me to work with. The other one that I get a lot of is the fool, which is living in the moment, um, short term focus, the spenders. So again, as soon as I see that, I know significant distress when they come to see you or, no, they're usually pretty happy with their situation, <laughs> but they know. Can you help me figure out how I know when I'm going to have money? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> what they need is control and structure. So yeah. they need cash flow planning, for example, because they've got their spending is like, whoa, everywhere. So immediately when I see the archetypes coming in, I can tell what what how to shape my conversation to know how I can best help them. Mm. So it's very interesting. Yeah, it's really, I guess, that whole um, pre- 
question yeah, to the client is really interesting because it's sort of because um, obviously you don't want to you don't want it to dictate any outcomes of the meeting Mm-mm. but I guess the, the perspective you're saying is it, it's giving you that um, way to get the most out of it yeah it is it, it helps you language your conversation with clients it's giving me a little like insight into what's going on for them without them having to tell me is it is there any correlation with like hbdi and things like that or Um, because a lot of people know that you got the left uh, yellow blue green and red sort of thing yeah it's all because it's that's all a um Deriv- derivative of carl young's work anyway so yeah it would be carl young because that's been around for a while I don't even know how old he is. He was, he's been around for a long time. So he's Can like, I go look him up? Yeah. <laughs> Young with a J. <laughs> okay. Um, oh. Yeah. So he's... German or something. Like the original thought person for... That's a good word, isn't it? Thought person. <laughs> his, technical term. Yeah, a technical term. He's thinking uh, people. Thinking people. He create, basically created modern psychology. So and gotcha. the concept of archetypes and... Um, fascinating start reading about his stuff but th- when you do the Myers-Briggs for example mm. you've got the different personality types they are basically archetypes yeah so just that he's they've been renamed into different yeah mine types. was um, I did a, a, a job I had a long time ago yeah and um, they they were able to allocate Simpsons characters to all these Myers-Briggs yeah, yeah. and have a guess uh, who, <laughs> who I ended you? up with <laughs> who were you Bart Simpson <laughs> Some people might be going, well, obviously. Like, <laughs> yeah. to fit. I was like, how cool is that? Oh, wait, what's wrong with that? Like, <laughs> I've thought about that too. Yeah, I've thought about that. Is like, how could I? Because these have names like the warrior, the magician, the creator, artist, the fool. Mm. But you could, you could create, add a bit more sort of yeah. And we spoke about entertainment that. to it. Sort yeah, because people can relate to The Simpsons. Like mm. nearly every single person has seen at least one episode of The Simpsons, so they could say, "Oh, well, you know, the the warrior is someone who be Lisa, for example, because she's very structured and planned and mm. methodical, and she's going to get it done." Sounds like you got it already. Yeah. Right? So look out for <laughs> a Simpsons theme. What would Mr. Burns be? He's the tyrant. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, is that an archetype? Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. So more critical, judgmental, uh, materialistic. What do you do with them? Help them to learn to step learn back. Learn to love. Learn to love. Yeah. Generally, they need some healing in that space because it's they're using money as a way to control the world. And that's generally because they're hurt underneath. So. Well, that was, that was, I guess, that question previously where I was like, shit, things get pretty deep. Yeah. Do you... Do you have to bring in like specialist psychologists sometimes? Yeah. Is that sort of yeah, definitely. It's yeah. completely out of my scope, and yeah. I don't want to be a therapist or a psychologist. Mm. But you can work with your clients to identify the issues, and then you know suggest that they go and see someone. Um, or a lot of them, like a lot of my US clients, already have someone that they're working with. So you know, it's a different cultural thing. So I can yeah, say, well, yeah, yeah. make sure you in your next conversation with your therapist that you're going to talk about this. Yeah. Yeah, so they can do that aspect of it because I don't want to get into any of that. That's not yeah, like yeah. I'm fascinated by it, but it's it's another lifetime. Yeah. I think <laughs> it's drawing it's drawing that line. I guess. Yeah, you. yeah, that's awesome. Lee, you're always doing, um, I guess, things with purpose and passion. Mm. And I'm sure there's something going on at the moment that um, you would love to share. I don't even know because I haven't asked you what the latest <laughs> thing is. Where do I start? But obviously, <laughs> obviously, there's the coaching. Yeah. Um, yeah, what do you have to share with the community in terms of what they can get behind or um, embrace? And- I'm working on a really cool app at the moment okay. um, called Financial Mindfulness. So essentially, it's for people who are stressed about money uh, and you go in and you listen to a meditation uh, to calm you down, to get you in a state of learning. Because when you're stressed, you're not operating out of your thinking brain, you're operating out of the fight or flight brain, mm. it's the reptilian brain. So this is designed to get you into a calmer space and then we educate through basic financial literacy, um, both audio and visual with videos and, and cards of information, um, which is all about habit change. How do they get out of the situation that they're in? Do little small changes. So mm-hmm. um, if you're going in, you're going, okay, I'm really stressed about my credit card debt, you would click the credit card and then go through the cycle of that. So that's uh, in beta testing at the moment. We've been working on it for almost two years so oh wow it's going to launch at the end of june so that's pretty exciting okay mm. very cool and is that something that i guess when we were talking about before like these um, ways for people to start 
getting their toe in the dipping their toe in the water with yeah. um, guidance and better information and mm-hmm. help with decision making is that mm-hmm. part of that strategy to help people yeah it's it's recognizing that a lot of people when they're stressed about money don't necessarily reach out for support it's like a you know money's taboo for a lot of people mm. and it's there's such a stigma around it so it's trying to encourage people to do something about the situation mm. Um, and then instilling education and empowerment to suggest that they go seek more support. Like that's the whole way through it's you could go see a mortgage broker, you could go see an advisor, you could go like different ways to encourage them to just yeah. keep taking steps to a little next step sort of thing. Yeah. And it is and through an app it's they're in control, they're not they're not reaching out to another human. They're they're sort of um, discovering it for themselves or figuring it out, solving the problem themselves. Yeah, absolutely. And or at least trying to, you know, making a start. And mm. it's to recognize that you know, 50% of Australians are stressed about money. There's, you know, it's the number one cause of stress globally. So really just saying, well, that's the problem. How do we bring a solution to that? Mm. Because financial advice is, is not necessarily for people who are stressed with money, mm. but there's a whole lot of people who... It doesn't matter how much income you have. You can be significantly stressed with money at any any income point. So yeah. it's kind of bringing a solution to that market in a way. That's awesome. And the money coaching? Money coaching is happening. So I'm training uh, with the founder from the US. She's coming to Australia. Uh, so we're co-training uh, at the moment. Uh, there's more programs happening there. I'll be heading back to the US in June to run some programs over there as well. Yeah, nice. Mm. And I'm going to take this opportunity to give everyone a little heads up that Lee's got a course on the way. <laughs> Just thought I'd get it uh, out in the ether there. So um, <laughs> Lee knows it's been said. So instead yeah. of looking at her prepared notes, uh, she actually goes and finishes it. Yeah, I actually, you know, what's really <laughs> crazy is I know that it will just take me one day to finish it off yeah. and I just have been procrastinating. But yes, it is coming very soon. You heard it here first, guys. <laughs> Lee's course on the x Advisor platform. Yes. Well, Lee, thank you very much for coming. This has been awesome. Yeah, Uh, I think a lot of people are going to get some great stuff about it and um, really exciting for tonight, the event. Yeah, me too. Thanks for having me.